Hi, I'm Kelly Baker Jamison, founder of Edible Blooms, and I'm here at Flinders University for Entrepreneurs in Conversation. I think it's so important just to take your idea and make it happen, and I hope you enjoy my story tonight. Now, I think initially, let's hear from you what's Edible Blooms all about. Uh, well, ed Edible Blooms, we're like a florist, but you get to eat our bouquets when they arrive. So there's that wow in the box when you open it up and a beautiful smell and a beautiful experience. Um, but I thought I'd just ask, before everyone had their invitation to come along tonight, who'd heard of Edible Blooms before? Okay, that's pretty good. Um, ten years on, thank you. A little bit of market research. <laughs> Marketing's working. <laughs> yeah, that's Money right. Well spent. Good job. So if we go back to 2005, when you were working in a corporate career, driving your little convertible around, what happened? What gave you the idea to switch out of that and trade it in for a purple delivery van and, and start making bouquets in your spare time? I know, it sounds a bit crazy. Um, I know my parents thought I was totally mad to leave um, a nice, safe corporate role. Uh, I was 26 and I think from a very early age I knew I always wanted to have my own business. So at about when I, was ten, when I turned 26, I'd moved to Brisbane and I was up there for work and I was lucky enough to be in a consulting role that I was working four days a week. So I actually dedicated a day a week to looking for that business idea that I could go out on my own with. And I looked at buying an established business, I looked at franchises, I even had a book idea at one point. <laughs> um, and finally, I settled on the concept of edible blooms because I've always loved gifting and I've always loved um, doing it well and uh, one of the frustrations I would experienced was when I'd ordered fresh flowers online for an interstate location you never quite knew what was going to turn up you know you sort of went on what was on the internet but someone else was delivering it so starting edible blend was a great concept because a it was the experience of it's not just something that gets thrown away you get to eat and enjoy it and share it with family and friends but also we have from the very beginning had a very recipe focus has been very consistent and that consistency has been part of our success I think that uh, if you order a bouquet from our Brisbane store or Adelaide store exactly the same thing arrives there's that peace of mind for customers knowing that it arrives so um, lots of lots of things sort of culminated and I think uh, I was I know luck is a is a is a tricky word to use as an entrepreneur but I do feel lucky that I had an idea that I loved and I have been able to make it into a successful business. Yeah, I think you've got a really unique combination. You were looking for a business um, and you carved out your own little niche mm. and you were super passionate about it. Yes. And you've said before that you actually built the business with a view to then selling it. So was there a particular strategy you had when you started your business with that in mind? Oh, I had the best strategy when I started. I wrote a business plan. Has everyone written a business <laughs> plan when they started their business? And, um, and it was to build this amazing gift business and sell it in five years. So 10 years on, I'm still here slogging away. I haven't actually finished yet. I feel like I've still got a lot to go, but I love my business more today than I did back then at the same time. So it's actually become my first child. <laughs> and it's very hard to sell your first child. Um, so, um, uh, so it's interesting. So what I, what I actually perceive would be the journey when I started, and I definitely started this business with a view to selling it. And I'm not ruling out that that wouldn't ever happen, but uh, I, I, I love going to work every day. So it's very hard to, to think of when that will be sold. Uh, so, but um, but you, you, I guess you never know what will come along. But um, yeah, that was the plan and it hasn't quite gone perfectly to plan. <laughs> but I think anyone in business would be able to relate to that. So you kind of fell in love with it yeah. more along the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah I did, yeah. And you, you've had opportunities to sell along the way, but I think what I've noticed with you is you're constantly evolving. So you've added extra arms to the business and it's not just edible blooms. Mm having leveraged itself, it's actually got quite a few arms to the business these days. So do you want to share some yeah. of that with us? Um, I, I'd love to. So to, uh, how many years ago? So two years ago, we started another business venture called Green Thumb Gifts, which is an online delivery business of living plants. So I, I guess similar to Edible Blooms being an alternative gift idea, I love the idea that you could send something that's flowering that would last um, versus cut flowers. So we started um, a business called Green Thumb Gifts. There's a little bit of a story to that. So uh, I 
married my husband five years ago. Six, I can't forget five years. <laughs> Gosh, time flies <laughs> when you're having fun. And and we were we were in Victoria when we met, and we came home to South Australia. And we bought a farm at Port Elliot, so that's where I live um, on a farm. We've got 350 acres down there, and we had this old shearing shed. And my husband, when I met him, had a Asia Pacific role, so he was on the plane all the time, I was on the plane all the time, and then we had our first child quite soon after getting married. So um, he actually said, um, I'm happy to forego my corporate career, and he wanted to start up another business. So we did that together, which is Green Thumb Gifts. And so we converted the old shearing shed on the farm into a nursery, and we ship Australia wide uh, from Port Elliot living plant gifts um, around the country. And then I had my second child. And entrepreneurs, we tend to get a little bit bored and boredom is not a good thing when you're an entrepreneur because you come up with ideas and, and my ideas uh, around that stage were to start up another hamper business because we started doing um, beautiful hamper gifts with edible blooms. So we created a brand new site for that. And then we created a florist here in South Australia for fresh flowers as well because all of my team are florists. So that kind of made a lot of sense. So we, ha we developed our fourth brand and so we rolled those out at the start of last year. And the hamper brand has been a lot more successful than our fresh flowers because since we did those and edible blooms has got even busier again <laughs> so it has been interesting and i think it's something that i don't think i've uh, cracked quite yet i haven't got it perfect as yet um, having multiple brands but it's interesting i think having multiple brands our customers feel like they can come to us for lots of occasions so it actually has made our core brand busier because they relate back to edible blooms I can get mm -hmm. a gift for any occasion so how we best deliver that through the online space is something we're still working at and we're still refining that process so it's an ever-evolving <laughs> um, journey but it's been really interesting and one of the learnings I've had from starting new brands in more recent times is a lot of clutter on the internet. There's, I think, uh, someone, I saw a statistic the other day, I think we see 800 different brands a day. Um, 30 years ago, I think we only saw 60 or something. Like, I don't know the exact figures, but the number of brands that we're exposed to in our days because of social media and online um, is just, it's just, and it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. And those statistics I saw the other day were still a year or two old. So I can't imagine what it would be like now. So when you're trying to launch a new brand, you've got a lot of clutter to get through. And I think that's a challenge for all marketers now is to get that cut through and to get that attention of customers because everybody is pushed for time. We're all tech savvy, so we all do more in our day. So to actually get time with somebody is the big challenge. I've sort of gone a bit off track there. No, that's okay. <laughs> it made sense to me. Uh, what I got out of that mainly is an idle mind is the devil's playground. It is, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes. Now, you went into an online business, which is a very tough space, and also into retail for the very first mm. time. So yes. really, two unknowns for you. Looking back, did you really know what you were up for? Uh, absolutely not. So just by way of background, my corporate background, I was working in professional services. So I was working for a top tier legal firm um, in their marketing and business development team. And suddenly I decided to start an online gift business. Go figure. But um, I had to learn about accounting. So I didn't know anything about, I did an MYB course before I started. And I still am on Facebook with my MYB instructor from Brisbane all those years ago. Um, I did a floristry course. I'd never worked in retail either. So it was a really steep learning curve. But I think in many ways that was really good because I had to delve in very deep. I had to learn about food safety and I had to have food accreditation because we were cutting up fresh fruit. Uh, there was all these different things I had to learn about. And so I was so busy logistically getting my business ready to open. I remember the Sunday night before I went to open Edible Blooms, I was living in Brisbane, I think I mentioned that earlier. And on the Sunday night, I suddenly realised I hadn't done any marketing because I'd been so busy getting all my logistics organised. So, you know, I'm the marketer. <laughs> I'd totally forgotten about it. So um, to launch Edible Blooms um, back then, I sent an email out. I know, knew 50 people. I had 50 business cards that I'd met in Brisbane in the first six months I was there. And I emailed them all and I, on the Sunday night from my home computer and I said, okay, this is the big thing I've been working on. This is Edible Blooms. And I sent the link and I, I was just saying to my marketing team this week, so it was a pasted email with pictures put in there. Um, everything's half price. Um, please, you know, tell your friends about it. And it actually started a viral campaign because 10 years ago, you didn't have as many emails in your inbox. So people did forward emails on. 
And so that first week, I actually made $1,000 in sales, which I couldn't believe because I thought I was going to be busy doing PR deliveries and things like that all week and sending out free product and I actually had people paying for things. So I kind of felt from that very first day when the phone rang the first morning with a, a man, he, I had to deliver it to um, Brisbane TAFE um, to his wife and it was just, just a just because gift and I thought I think I'm onto something here. So yeah, I did feel like I was onto the right thing. And again, I transgress. 50 people? Yeah. $1,000 in sales. Yeah, I know, it was amazing. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good conversion. Um, so you've had some really momentous milestones along the way and you've grown really rapidly mm. from the very beginning. What do you think are some of the steps that you took and maybe the risks you took that really contributed to that accelerated growth that you've had? Um, I think the thing that, um, and I actually find it hard saying uh, I've been successful, but I guess I have been, so I have to sort of say yes. But um, I think the things that we did well as a team were all around our marketing and building our brand. So we did some brand research last year and at that point we had, I think, three in 10 Australians were aware of, this is just a general, it could be anyone, three in 10 people knew of our brand. And we did some television, which has been very good for us in recent times. Uh, and it jumped up, it doubled. So we had a dub, like our brand recognition doubled from that campaign. But I think early on in the zero budget marketing activities that we've done is, I've been very regimented about measuring the success of every marketing campaign we do. And because we operate in multiple states, I always try and geographically test a new concept. So if there's a, something new, a new marketing spend, even when we dipped our toe into television, we tested it geographically. So we just did a campaign in South Australia, mm -hmm. which was the lowest cost state to run a TV campaign in. So it's about measuring those results and making sure it's returning to the bottom line. Um, the same happened in uh, this Valentine's Day. We did our first big display campaign. That didn't work for us. It was, I should have, I actually reported back to my Google account manager, I said, so, I could have stood on the street corner and handed out $500 to everyone and paid them to come and visit my store. That's how much it cost me for a lead on that channel, which I've never had that experience before. But I have heard of other brands that have had sex success with display, but it just didn't work for us. So again, it's about testing. And we again did a small test. So whenever we try a new marketing channel, we just test it, see what the return is and we know exactly what every lead costs us and what every conversion costs us to get that sale into the shopping cart. And then if it works, we spend more. <laughs> or we do more. So not everything costs money, but the things that cost us actual mm. marketing dollars, we put more in if it works. And you did a very gutsy thing in your first, was it in your first year that you opened three yes. stores? Yeah. I was so afraid actually, when I first started Edible Blooms, because I was really excited by the idea my biggest fear was that somebody with more money, because I started with a $20,000 cash, that was all my savings that I put in to start the business. Um, so my biggest fear when I started was somebody coming along with deeper pockets and copying me and getting the runs on the board and then, and I had to put personal guarantees on all of the leases. So I opened three stores in my first year and I had personal guarantees that if this didn't work, I was going back to work to keep paying leases. So I, it, was a, it was quite a big risk personally. And so I had to make it work. So I just naively just went for it. I didn't think I couldn't do it. I didn't think it was too hard. I just did it. And looking back, I don't know if I'd be quite as courageous now, but um, I'm glad I did do it. Um, and for that first year, the first eight months of that year, I was also juggling uh, 30 hours a week of consulting for the law firm while I opened the three stores. So we had three stores open when I resigned from that role, which meant that I was working every minute of the day, seven days a week, <laughs> to keep the wheels moving. And uh, so it was a pretty, uh, exci it was exciting, but it was hard work. I took multivitamins every day because I couldn't afford to have a sick day. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I just ran, I just was so busy that first year. I lost a lot of weight. I just think I forgot to eat a little bit, which is unusual for me because I love food and I love chocolate. <laughs> So, so the there three were stores were? Uh, we, I, I was in Brisbane first and we opened in Adelaide. There's a little story about why we opened in Sydney third. So my original business plan was to open in Melbourne third and Sydney fourth because just as I was opening the Brisbane store, there was actually a company in Sydney that had started doing fruit bouquets and I thought, oh, I nearly didn't open actually. I, nearly, I thought someone's beaten me to it, I can't open. 
but within that first year they had contacted me to sell their business to me so that was good um, we didn't buy it but um, I suddenly went up oh, yep no keep going keep going but when I was in Adelaide the advertiser interviewed me about the Adelaide opening and I told the journalist that we were opening in Melbourne next and the Sydney um, Daily Telegraph must have been having a slow news day because they're all syndicated and they take the stories and they published the Adelaide story but they changed it and they said the Edible Blooms is opening in Sydney next. <laughs> and that was when the Sydney company contacted me to say would I like to sell, would I like to buy their business and I suddenly went I'm opening in Sydney next. So, <laughs> so it changed the, the plan. Um, so it was really interesting. So there's little things and I think so it's something I did learn is that it's always great to have a plan but you need to change it if an opportunity comes along. So do you run on gut instinct a fair bit? Totally, yeah, totally. When I resigned from my consulting role in that first year my bookkeeper said to me, no Kelly you can't do that because I was cash flow funding a lot of the business doing that consulting work and I said no I have to, I have to do it and it was a hard decision at the time but it was the right decision because I could invest 100% of my time into growing the business. So it was really important. Yeah. Mm. So that was another question I had. How do you know when to jump ship? You know, you're funding a business, you've got three leases, you've got a job that's paying the rent and you're hoping that sales keep going. At which point did you know that you had to jump ship and what gave you the confidence? Um, I was probably going to collapse if I didn't <laughs> quit my day job. So um, it was probably a forced decision in that respect but um, but I again it was that it, it, it's something that you can't really describe but I think as an entrepreneur you have to back yourself and if you won't back yourself you can't expect anyone else to back you. So I had my, I was employing staff I had to give everything to make sure it was a success so I think at the end of the day it's got to be if you can't back yourself you shouldn't be doing it. Mm. And just going back to the Sydney store opening, is that how you ended up dressing as a strawberry? Do <laughs> yes, you want to share that story with oh, yeah. us? Actually, there's a couple of things I might share um, around that question. So I've always liked to do out of the box marketing and um, a great example early on was we'd open the Sydney store and I needed to generate sales and I didn't have a lot of money to do that. So I had flyers that I'd paid to have printed. That was even a big thing to pay to have flyers <laughs> printed out of my very meagre marketing budget. But I thought, um, oh, maybe I'll stand on a street corner or hand out some flyers. And I remembered when I, used to, when I was younger and I was on my working holiday in London at the front of the tube stops, there'd always be people handing out flyers and everyone would just walk past and ignore them. No one wanted to take them. So I thought, well, maybe if I dressed up as a strawberry, people would take my flyers. So I actually hired a strawberry costume in Brisbane and flew down to my Sydney store with it in my suitcase. And um, with my leggings on, I put the strawberry costume on and I headed out of my Sydney store with a bunch of flies. And our Sydney store at that time was just off of Oxford Street, Paddington, but we were in the colourful, the, the cheaper part, which was Darlinghurst, which was pretty colourful. Like we, we see all sorts of different people dressed up at different hours of the day there. So I didn't look too out of the ordinary there in a strawberry suit, but I headed down and I walked up Oxford Street, Paddington, and I had a cyclist that was coming down the road and he put his hand out and I handed him a flyer and I went into one of the big cosmetic stores on Oxford Street Paddington. They had a photo with me so they could show the area manager who was coming in later that a strawberry had come into their store. And I actually got rid of all my flyers. Really, I didn't even get the whole way up for Oxford Street Paddington. So it's just a really simple example of a really traditional marketing tool that suddenly put a little spin on it and suddenly you get more traction. We're about to embark on our biggest, and this is, um, you'll be the first to hear about this tonight because this is a very new thing that we're working on. So um, our new out of the box marketing idea is we are building a 10 by seven metre chocolate garden that we're gonna tour around Westfields around the country this year. And it's a marketing stunt. We've got uh, Sophie Thompson, the ABC gardening designer. She's designing the garden for us and it'll be a walkthrough experience. People will be able to walk through and be involved in a whole 360 degree chocolate garden. So that's a bigger budget example, but it's about taking something and um, doing it differently. You've got to, and that's where I was saying before about the cut through. There's so much clutter, you've got to do something really different to try and get that cut through of your brand. And so, um, yeah, so we're really excited about that. And we've got some big goals of where we want that strategy to go, but, uh, it's just a, it's just an example of doing things differently, and I think that's something 
that I've enjoyed. I get more, I get buzz out of that. That really excites me coming up with those different ideas. I came up with that idea of the chocolate garden to enter it into the Melbourne International Flower Show four years ago, um, just before I had children, and um, they rejected the idea. So now I'll take it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck keeping kids from. Yeah, I know that's. We're, we're working tempted. on that. We're working on that. <laughs> So with marketing things like that, it's very, you know, it's about being creative, but also I see you doing a lot of marketing that's, you know, face to face and, and real life marketing, even though your business is generated on online. So mm. do you find that that is a very unique thing that you do where you're actually very aware of marketing and, and building customer awareness? Yeah, um, I guess things like um, events, we, we, get, we get involved in events where we give away products and things like that. It doesn't, it's really hard to track that conversion to sale because we ask customers, did you hear about us in an event? But they're not always going to say that. So that's kind of a bit of a gut feel thing and it's something that in some ways you do as a sponsorship and marketing, it's sort of like a tick box in some ways as a company. So I think it works. I don't have as clear... Um, I don't have clear facts around exactly how much business that drives in, but I do think it helps because I think you've got to see a brand repetitive times to, to get that cut through. So um, the in-person marketing does work. And uh, the other thing that we work on is we looked at our customer touch points and we actually have two customers in every transaction. So we have the person who sends the gifts and we have the person that receives the gifts. So we market differently to each of those people because we want repeat work from people who've received a gift who want to come back and use us again. So they get a gift voucher and to encourage them to do that. And the person that sends to us gets different communications and rewards and things like that. So we have a different comms strategy for both channels. So and I keep going off track. No. <laughs> I'm good at talking as I know you are. <laughs> We're both very good at talking. Um, I wanted to know uh, about your plan and what systems you've put in place to allow yourself to extract yourself from the business. I know when you had your second child, you, mm. you almost managed to do it. Yeah. Um, and now you're, you're back working again because you can't help yourself. But you have set the business up so that it can run without you. Yes. If you chose to. Yes. So what systems did you put in place and how did you manage to build that into the business as it was growing to make yourself expendable? Well, it all comes down to systems. So the business day-to-day -day runs beautifully. I don't have to touch it operationally. My role in the business now is to grow the business. Mm -hmm. And so when I had a team in uh, doing all of the day-to-day, -day, it ran, it, it grew s slower. Now that I'm back in the business, it's growing faster because it's got a, a different feel. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have had that same experience that when they're physically in the business, it grows at a different rate than if you have managers in the business. Mm -hmm. And managers do a great job and I had an amazing team, but it's not the same as your own fingerprint on the business. So, uh, and I'm really energised, I think in some ways, because I started the business with no budget, I was quite young and I worked really, really hard for so many years. When I got around to having children, I think I was almost burnt out. So I think I needed a break. So in hindsight, I think it was a good thing that I had to have that break from the business. But I was checking my emails. I was in the delivery suite. I'm checking my emails, you know. <laughs> it's, a very, it's very hard to just totally cut off from the business. And some people will say that's not healthy, but um, I like what I do. So it's a very hard thing to turn off. And even on, on holidays, I still often log on and clear out my inbox and things like that. But I can, I can take time off. It's just me being me that does that. But, um, uh, but I can walk away from my business and it runs without me now. But it all comes down to the systems and really good people. I have an amazing team, absolutely amazing. Our Mother's Day this year, we, were, we exceeded our stretch sales target because our TV campaign was um, really successful for us. And I had the most amazing team around the country. They all stayed back and got every order out and they were just amazing. And um, so I think it's the team that sits behind me in the business that make it run so well. Mm. So looking back on it now, if you had to do it again, is there anything you'd do differently? Um, every now and then I've thought I'd love to have had more money to start the business, but in some ways it's a blessing not to have too much money because you have to learn the hard way. You have to do everything yourself. So I like that I know everything. I 
Actually, Mother's Day, I was out delivering on Mother's Day this year because we needed more hands on deck. So I love being really involved and I'm happy. If we're busy, I'm, you know, I'll dip strawberries, I'll do whatever we need to do to get things out the door. Um, but to do things differently, I think having a holiday before you start, because it's actually a long, when you start a new business, it's quite a while before you can actually just take a week or two block out of the business and take some time out. So I always say have a holiday. And the other thing I learned, I remember soon after I started the business, I wanted a new credit card for points, you know, like, cause I love, I'm a bit of a points junkie. And um, because I was self-employed, they just said no straight away. And I was like, what? Cause it always, when you've got a corporate job, you can, those things, you just fill out a form and you get it back and it's fine. And um, so there's all those little things that are, you have to learn. I always, if someone's starting a business, I say, apply for every, and you say this, I know, Miriam, apply for every credit card you need, <laughs> get a new car, do all the things that you need to do, because it's a while before you can do it. I think you said to me the other day that it's about five years. Well, you, you have to have been in business for two years. Two but years, you have but. Two years, strong financials. Yeah, so which it takes, takes a while to build up. Years. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So, um, so there's some of the things that I think I always, you know, give tips before people start. So take a break first. Yeah. And um, be prepared. And it has to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? It costs money for that holiday too. Actually, maybe just go on a cheap holiday. Borrow someone's house. Don't spend any money on the holiday, but just take a holiday because you'll need the money. Um, but um, and other things differently. Look, I made um, some mistakes uh, with team hires. It's something that you learn um, about finding the right people fit, and so. What I have learned is you've got to hire the right person, not the skill set. So it's about getting the right people fit for your team. So that's that was some certainly some lessons that I learnt early on. And you don't always get things right. And I think just forgive yourself, allow yourself to get a few things wrong, and don't get too cross with yourself. Because um, and the other thing I've become really cool about is not having everything perfect. So. As an entrepreneur, you realise you've got to do everything to about 90% and get it up and not wait until it's so perfect and you've spent so long that you've taken an extra six months to get it to market. So um, I, our, our website is a continual test environment. Like we're putting your products on there, seeing if you like them. If you don't like them, we'll pull them down and put something else up. And it's, it's a really moving space. So um, learning to say it's okay not to be perfect has been something that um, I think I've learnt along the way too. Mm. Thank you. For anyone with a good idea, you're always going to have someone that will copy you. It takes a lot longer than you think it will. I thought I'd have copycats earlier than I did, but now I've got lots. Um, so at first I was really afraid of competition. I always thought, oh God, they're going to take, you know, I'll, I won't have a business. It'll be, I'll, it'll be over before it started. But what it actually has done for us, it's made us busier. So the more awareness there is, because we are a niche product and we're creating our own category as an alternative to flowers. So the more people that make noise about it, it's actually, and then people go online, they'll compare like for like, and we have great delivery systems and promises and you know all those things, we give a great guarantee. So, um, and not, we're more expensive than a home operator because they don't have o overheads of stores. So it's actually been good for us. So we see our, our web traffic increases as we get more competitors. I mean, it could be our own marketing as well, but I think it actually helps. So I think as long as you concentrate on the core things that are gonna make you, people choose you to buy, which is great value, great delivery, great prices, um, uh, and great service, um, you'll always do well with competition. But what, and, and I used to worry about who were copying our exact designs and we've got a lot of people who literally just, we've had people take photos off of our website and put it on theirs and I can write a letter in two seconds flat to sort that out. But, um, but uh, it's, and you know, even copy, we have people who take whole pages off of our website and just paste it on a new site to start up. And so again, really easy to, if they've taken copy, they've taken images, it's really quick to sort out. But if it's similar design, it's very grey and people who know, you know, it's a, it's a hard thing to follow up. But we just concentrate now. We have an actual product development pipeline, so we aim to bring out new products so regularly that, you know, 
So, it, so it's harder for them to keep copying and we've seen a lot of people enter the market and then leave as well. We haven't had any strong competitors that have stuck around. So we've had our, you know, our challenges along the way and we originally used a lot of refrigerated transport to get our gifts out but then we found it was quite restrictive because there's less vehicles out on the road that are refrigerated. So we did a lot of testing. So our um, fresh fruit products only go within a 15 kilometre radius of our stores whereas our chocolate products go overnight anywhere in Australia. So our chocolate products, we package and we have ice packs that are all recyclable and we package them in delivery boxes. And we have a delivery guarantee. So we know every now and then there's gonna be a courier that will kick a box or will drop it over a fence or a dog will eat it or something will happen. We just replace it. All the customer has to do for us is take a photograph with their phone, email it in and we, we resend it. So if it gets delayed in transit or something goes wrong, because that does happen from time to time, we just replace it and make that customer experience so good they want to still come back again. <laughs> um, but it is it is challenging and we've we experimented, we've tried all different types of boxes for delivery. Um, we do different thickness of cardboard in, in summer versus winter. So yeah, summer is a harder time for us. We have a, we go through pallets and pallets of ice packs. <laughs> the girls here know all about that. <laughs> I've got some of my Edible Blooms team here. So um, yeah, and we but we also try and um, make that packaging as sustainable as we can. So the recyclable ice packs are great. People can use them again. So yeah, and we're always looking for new. If anyone has new suggestions on delivering packaging, come and see me afterwards. I'd like to be in more countries actually in ten years' time. I'd like to see Edible Blooms grow. Um, further overseas. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of take up in other countries as we have in Australia. A lot of copycats here but we're not seeing as many overseas. So there's still a lot of opportunity for us there. Um, in my intro I said we're in seven stores because our Perth, we're opening in Perth, you know, actually it's in June now but <laughs> it was going to be now. Um, but we got really busy with Mother's Day so we'll have only in Australia we'll stick with our one large store in each city but I think we will still be moving even though we have just the one large centre of production and dispatch in each city, over the last 10 years, each of those stores has moved at least three times to give us more floor space to cope with our growth. So I'll, I'll be a professional removalist <laughs> in 10 years' time. Um, I already have a pretty good checklist I can share if anyone needs to move an office. Um, and yeah, but I think overseas would be where I'd like to see us move in the next 10 years. And hopefully I might still be here, that'd be nice. And the, actually the other point of that, and this is something that um, I'd really like Edible Blooms to be a top of mind brand name when people are gifting for occasions. So rather than cut flowers, and I really want our gift range to be even more dynamic than it is now. So I don't think, it won't look anything like it does now in 10 years, it'll be totally different again. So our fresh fruit range, we have fruit buyers that go out to the markets for us fresh every morning to source and we are not a price buyer, we just buy the best. So um, we can always guarantee the best strawberries that are available, that's what's in our stores. Um, but there are certain times of the year it's, it's harder than others to get that perfect produce. So if we're not quite happy with the quality, we'll call a customer and say, look, it's not as, would you like to substitute for a chocolate bouquet today? Um, and, and we also put less of our fruit products up if we're not happy with the, pro the, um, the quality of the produce that we're getting. And sometimes the challenge we have is that at the moment, South Australia, we're getting the most beautiful strawberries mm -hmm. and our Sydney store and our Brisbane stores are struggling. They're not getting the same supply because they're actually coming. Parker strawberries in South Australia are amazing at the moment. If anyone sees them, they're really good. Um, so, um, so we've actually told our buyers to try and look out for that particular grower if they can get them. So we try and manage it as best we can. Um, but there are times that it is more challenging, uh, seasonal. Whereas our chocolate bouquet range is consistent all year round. We have, we only use Chocolatier, Lint, Ferrero and Barchi. So we use only really premium brands as our supply lines and it's really consistent. Do you know, that was really easy because I don't like detail. <laughs> so as soon as I've got a process in place, I'm quite happy to let go of the little stuff. But, um, so I'm a control freak in some ways, but not all. So, um, but yeah, detail is definitely not my strength and my team would be happy to back me up on that one. <laughs>